the nation. A podcast by your host, the nationally renowned criminal defense attorney, Neil Rockheim. Hey, everybody, it's Neil Rockheim, your host of Killer Cross Examination. And I want to tell you that I get texts and messages and calls and Facebook messages and messages all over the place asking me to talk about a whole variety of different subjects. I get questions about cases of mine and and tough witnesses and techniques and tactics and tricks and all kinds of, of different questions about how to handle certain situations during cross-examination. Because cross-examination is the most important part of every trial. Voir dire, which is the jury selection part, is of course critical. It's important. It it sets the tone for for picking and 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 selecting and deselecting jurors and beginning to set the themes and theories for the defense in the case. But cross examination, that's that's the meat. That's that's what people come to that's where the defense lawyer has the ability to, to change the course of the case. Remember, the prosecutor starts the case, opening statement. Defense gets to make an opening statement. The prosecutor gets to then directs a witness. And direct examination is, is straightforward. It's relatively easy. It's, by the time a witness takes the witness stand and raises his or her right hand to testify at the trial, you pretty much know at least the witness pretty much knows the questions the prosecutor is going to ask. The prosecutor pretty much knows what the, the, the witness's answers are going to be. I mean, if they've talked at all, and then nowadays it's pretty easy to talk, whether it's by you know, phone call or FaceTime or Zoom or smoke signal or Morse code, they have some way to communicate. You can do hand signs, the signals. They have some way before the trial to communicate. By the time the witness takes a stand on direct examination, the prosecutor and that witness have essentially scripted it out. Doesn't mean it's going to be word for word. Doesn't mean written out question and answer like a script in a play or a TV show. But the witness knows what the questions are going to be and what the topics are going to be. And and the, the prosecutor knows what the witness's answers are going to be. So it's pretty much scripted. The witness knows what to, what to offer. But cross-examination, that's a surprise. That's a surprise. It's got to be a surprise. It's like opening the door and, you know, you surprise. Because they have no idea what's coming. They should have no idea what's coming. If the witness takes the stand and on cross-examination knows exactly what the lawyer is going to do, then that lawyer has done a piss-poor job of putting together a cross-examination. He may, the witness may think that he knows, may think that he has recovered. He may think that he is playing this sort of, I know where the, the lawyer is going with this. And maybe the, the, the witness knows, has been prepared for some of the topics that the lawyer is going to question him about. Or maybe some of the areas that we're going to go into. But not how, and not the order. And not how we're going to lead him down this, the hallway Closing each and every door. Boom. Door closed. Door closed. Door closed. And then you put to the witness that final question that shows that the witness is lying or that he really has testimony that is favorable to your client. Walking them down that hallway. Picture like the haunted mansion, you know, on that ride and all the doors are in that one hall. And you want to keep closing those doors. Door closed. Door closed, door closed, door closed until they're at the end of the the hall and there's nowhere else, there's no room for them to escape. There's no escape room, there's no hatch, there's no escape hatch, there's no no outlet, they're stuck, they're trapped. So maybe they know the areas that you may are going to cover, but they don't know that you're going to do that or how you're going to do it if you do it correctly. But the topic that I get asked the most about believe it or not, is how do I handle the difficult judge, Neil? How do I handle the difficult judge? 
How'd you handle a judge in this case? How'd you handle a judge in that case? I watched the video of yours and the judge was constantly interrupting. You know, I watched the video of yours and the judge was constantly throwing in jokes and trying to, to, to make light of it. I, I watched the video and the judge was all over you, Neil. I read one of your transcripts and the judge was so, so impossible to you. How do I handle it? Age old question, brilliant question. It's the most often asked question I get. How do you handle it? Carefully. Like you're carrying, you know, like like a remember Eddie Murphy in that in the 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 Beverly Hills cop where he's carrying that bag, it's just vitamins, but he's carrying this bag and he's saying that they're like these explosive shells and he's sweating and he's carrying these he's like <laughs> how do you handle it? Fragilely. You handle that with care. Let me tell you why. There are some great judges out there. There are some average judges. And just as you can imagine, there are some terrible, awful judges out there. Let me, let me tell you a couple of things that I've learned over the course of my many years of courtroom experience. Jurors think you walk into a courtroom and they walk in they march their little feet in and they sit down and they see the judge with his or her black robe and the clerk calls the case, all very official and noble-like and says, you know, please rise for the honorable and whatever the judge's name is. And everybody stands up and there's one unison sound and they sit down all together and they think, oh my God, this judge, look at the black robe. The judge sits up on high. There's marble all around and there's gold railings this judge is an authority figure. The judge is the smartest person in the room, the jurors think. They don't know that judge. They don't know if the judge knows about a particular area of law. They don't know if the judge has spent any time at all prior to becoming a judge practicing in, the, the, in criminal law or business law or litigation or personal injury. They have no idea. They assume that the judge knows the law, knows the rules, and is fair and knows good lawyering. They assume all those things because that's what they've come to be have been told by, by the media, by the, the public. That's the, the appearance of the judge as this all-knowing, powerful, Solomon-like figure. As many of you know, they're wrong. As I said, there are some very good judges out there who are very even-handed and do know many areas of law. There are also some judges out there that have been either appointed or elected, some appointed by politicians. They have almost no experience in one of the areas of law that they're going to be deciding. There are judges who spent zero time, zero time handling criminal cases, and they all of a sudden became criminal law judges. And so they preside over the case. They walk in the courtroom. I know. The prosecutor knows. Maybe the deputies know. Maybe the legal community knows that the judge doesn't know a thing about criminal defense or about having been a trial lawyer or how to try a case or the rules of evidence or any of the things that one needs to know when you're about to try a case. But the jury doesn't know that. They think, there's the judge. That's the judge. The judge knows everything. And so if the judge yells at you or yells at me, they think, oh, my God. If the judge says, uh, Mr. Rockheim, that's, not, that's the wrong way to ask that question, they think, oh, my God, Rockheim doesn't know how to ask a question. They don't think to themselves, that was a perfectly good question, and I would love to hear the answer, judge. That, or they don't think the judge doesn't know how to try a case. They think, He's the judge, and the judge has just told Rockhine he's wrong, therefore Rockhine is wrong. Or the judge says, Rockhine, you didn't ask the question the right way, and the, ju- the, the, the jury looks at the judge and says, see, the judge knows Rockhine doesn't know how to ask the right question. Let me tell you this. Do you realize that to be a judge, the qualifications are that you have to have five years of practice? You have to be an elector in that community, which means you have to be a voter. Five years of practice, and you can't be over 70 to be elected a judge. That's it. Doesn't mean you have to have five years in each area or five years doing prosecutions and five years doing defense. 
or two and a half years doing prosecutions and two and a half years doing defense, or one year in all these different areas, or six months having intern in different areas. Think about that. Doctors, before they become doctors, they have to do their rotation. They got to go through, they got to practice in all these different areas to at least learn about them before they pick their specialty, not judges. You could be a divorce lawyer your entire legal career and then take the bench, get appointed as a judge or win an election, maybe because you're a good judge, maybe because you've got great qualifications, maybe because you have the right name, nobody knows. And you end up becoming a judge. And even though you've only spent time doing divorce law, you now take the bench and you preside over personal injury cases, business litigation, complex business litigation, real and real estate property litigation, and criminal law cases, even though you've had no experience in any of those areas. Can you think of any other like profession where... The, I mean, imagine like a baseball umpire never having, you know, studied or played the game. I guess it's possible, but I bet you they make pretty crappy baseball umpires. Like, how are you supposed to call balls and strikes if you've never, like, actually pitched or caught or studied the strike zone or at least studied the game of baseball? I mean, you wouldn't just all of a sudden say you're going you're gonna to be the umpire behind the plate judging uh, 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 the, the seventh game of the World Series, but you've only played basketball. We might say, yeah, you're a decent athlete. And maybe you do know the rules of basketball, but if you're going to judge a baseball game, an umpire baseball game, we expect you to know baseball. Think about that. We got like, people that have specialized or focused their practices in the legal field in other areas, who become a judge, they put the robe on, and the jurors think that these judges know everything about every area of law. Some don't know anything about trying cases. Some have sought the bench out as a place to do great good, sacrificing their careers for the public good, to bring some fairness, justice to the bench. Others have sought out the bench as a way of, as a place of, of refuge. They, they wanted to become a judge. That was like their goal, not because they wanted to do great, because that was a place where they didn't have to actually practice law. And they would have power and prestige. And guess what? The first category of judge and the second category of judge look exactly the same to the juror. So let me give, let me answer some of the questions about how you deal with difficult judges. Gingerly, carefully, wisely, smartly. And there's one rule, one golden rule that every lawyer has to remember. Keep in the back of your mind that when you're in a trial, that jurors think to themselves that the judge knows all. In some half-a-day trial or a one-day trial, I don't care who the sages out there, what lawyers out there tell you something different. I don't care who writes this in a book. And if you send me the book or the passage or tell me the lawyer that disagrees with me, I will have an actual debate with them about this. But in a short trial, you as a lawyer are never going to convince a jur- the, the, the jury or show the jury that the judge is being mean or picking on you or being rude or getting in your way or doesn't know the rules of evidence or has it out for you. I know there are lawyers who think that, that oh, do this or that, and the, you'll, you'll show the, the, the jury that the judge doesn't like you or is being unfair. Bullshit. Over a long trial, over a very, very, very long trial where you're all together for a long period of time, yeah, the jurors can start to figure out if the judge is being fair or not. Over a long trial, we're all in the same, and I've had those trials, where I've been in the courtroom for a long period of time with the judge and the, the jurors, and we're in there every day, and guess what? The jurors aren't stupid. They begin to figure out, they begin to see, they begin, they can tell who the good lawyers are, 
they can begin to tell when the judge is being unfair. But in a short trial, not going to happen. Jurors will come in on a Monday morning, take the oath, sit, are selected, uh, hear opening statements, hear a couple of witnesses, um, hear a defense witness or two, and then preside over closings and then make a, a, a ruling all on the same day. No, they believe in those short trials, absent something really, really, really remarkable, they believe the judge is, is all-knowing and fair. You're never going to convince a, a juror. Never gonna, don't count on that, oh, if I just keep doing this, the, the jurors, the, the judge will see. The jurors will see. The, the, they'll become enlightened. Their eyes will open. They'll see that the judge is being unreasonable. Nah, bullshit. You keep that in mind. In a short trial, that's... You're not going to all of a sudden, like, and you can't wink and nod and hold up little notes for the, the, the jury to say, see, he's being mean. Or go watch YouTube at lunch and you'll see, look at judge so-and-so, you'll see what a real judge is like. No, doesn't happen. Short trial, the, the, the jurors are going to believe. They're not going to be persuaded. They're going to b- believe. They're not going to be led to believe. They're not going to catch on that the judge is being overly unfair. Long trial, yes, it's possible. And it can happen. And it can help you. But let me give you the golden rule. It's not about you, bub. Judges mean to you, it's not about you. Judges being unfit, being difficult with you, it's not about you. It's not about your ego. It's not about showing the judge who's boss. I've heard all kinds of lawyers say, oh yeah, I really gave it back to that judge. I, he wouldn't let me speak and I gave it back to him. I had to show him that you can't push me around in the courtroom. Bullshit. It's not about you. It's not about you, pal. It's not about you, Skip. It's not about you, lawyer. It's about your client. That is all that matters. It's not about your ego. It's not about showing a judge who's boss. It's not about sticking up for yourself. It's about the client. That's it. That's all that matters. You think you won some duel with the the judge because you gave it back to the judge and you didn't get pushed around? Great. The only question I got to ask for you is, did it help your client? If it helped the client, then you were right. So sticking up for yourself and pushing back against a difficult judge, if the jurors saw and and believed that that was the right thing to do and you didn't come across like you're argumentative and disrespectful and hostile and incompetent, good. But if you just did it because you can't be pushed around and you're going to show the judge who's boss... Got news for you. The jurors or a number of jurors on the jury look at you and think that you're being disrespectful and rude and inconsiderate because you're combating the authority figure that they know. The only person in the courtroom, as far as they're concerned, that they know is the authority figure. And you're not helping your client. Maybe you'll win the case in spite of yourself, but you're not helping the client. That's all that matters. I've heard all these stories about, of, ju- of lawyers that say, oh, the judge wouldn't let me get a word in edgewise at, at my client's arraignment. He was mean and pushed me around, and I tried to stick up for myself, and then I got into an argument. And then the judge threatened to hold me in contempt, and then I argued back, and you know, I'd skip over all that nonsense. So my only question, what happened to your client? Did what you did in battling the judge... Did you get your client bail? Did you get your client reasonable and favorable conditions at a bail or bond hearing? That's all that matters. The idea that you somehow fought back and you showed your spirit or your stridency. If your client went off to jail, then you weren't effective. Stridency just to, for the benefit of the lawyer is bullshit. That is not effective advocacy. It's about your client. Remember, Dory, who, who, who was the one who made that comment? Who said that? I'm trying to think. Who said it? it's, it's the economy, stupid? Was that, uh, I think that was, was that Bill Clinton who made that comment? It's the economy, stupid? Or that was the joke about that election? It's the economy, stupid? I think that was, well, whatever candidate made that comment or wherever that became the refrain for a candidacy, it's about the client, stupid. It's all that matters. About the client, stupid. About the client, pal. 
Did your advocacy help the client? Some examples, okay? One of the things I hear all the time is the judge doesn't know the rules of evidence. I understand. Got it. Been there. Man, have I been there. You don't even know how, how often I've been there. Because I pride myself as a lawyer that knows the rules of evidence and knows how to utilize the rules of evidence. I had a judge once who, as I'm impeaching a witness and I did a two-way impeachment, I impeached the witness with what he didn't tell the police and what he did tell the police. So I was trying to show that the witness was lying two different ways. He told the police X, he didn't tell the police Y. Then I impeached with what he did actually tell the, 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 the police. And I tell you, I mean, the judge was like, he was interrupted. Call me to the bench. So that's not the way you impeach. I said, I, I, Your Honor, I, I, I beg to differ. He said, I'm looking at the rule right here. I said, I, I, I have the rule in front of me, Your Honor. I know. He didn't do it in front of the jury, but we were at the bench. We were at the bench for a long time. So the jurors know that the judge, he didn't call me to the bench to ask me, like, you know, I mean, how I'm doing or how my family is or to pat me in the back and say, you're doing a great job there, Neil. He called me to the bench. The jurors can pick up on it because he wanted to, he wasn't happy with something that I was doing. It was, I mean, you would have to have literally had, like, I guess, been one of those soundproof, you know, glass-enclosed cases with, you know, no, all mirrored in glass to not have known why the judge called me to, you'd have had to have been deprived of all senses to know, to not understand the judge was calling me to the bench to try to, to dress me down about something. I'm at the bench. I'm not screaming or, or waving my finger at the judge. You don't see me getting red faced. I understand that all eyes are on me. He's the authority figure. The jurors can see it. And so I'm now up there trying to figure out how do I continue to do the impeachment that I know I'm doing correctly with the judge who believes I'm doing it incorrectly. And he showed me the rule and I pointed out the part. I was very polite and I pointed, kept my voice down. It wasn't like going crazy. Kept my voice down. I pointed to the part of the rule. He said, you have to show the witness the writing or document that you're using to impeach with before you can ask a question of the witness. And I said, I, I, I pointed to the rule. I said, you don't have to show it to him first. I have to give the witness an opportunity to explain prior statement, deny it or explain it, which I was doing. And I, I also have to give the witness, if the witness requests it, wants to see it, I have to give the witness an opportunity to inspect it, to see it. Witness hadn't asked for it. He knew I had him. The witness knew that I had him in a corner. He knew he had never told the police the things he was saying during the trial. And he knew he was testifying to things that were different than what he told the police. So the ju I said, Judge, um, this is what the rule says. He says, well, I'm, I know you're not doing it right. And I said, Judge, with all due respect, uh, I believe I am doing it right. I think this is what the rule says. The witness hasn't asked to see it yet. He says, well, I'm going to find a case that says that you're wrong. I know I've got it at the tip of my tongue. And I said, okay, Your Honor. You find the case, and I will, of course, you know, I'll read it, and I'll react to it. And if, you're, if it turns out that you, I have to do it a different way, I will. I step back. I'm still waiting for that case now, to this day. Won that trial, and I, but I'm still waiting I see that judge here and there at like a function or, a, or out in the community. I'm polite as could be. I say hello. I think he even remembers the case. One, once in a while, we even kind of chatted about it. But I know this. Every time I see him, I keep wondering to myself, is he going to produce that case that said I was doing it th the wrong way? I know he can't because I wasn't. I was doing it textbook. I was like Iceman. Textbook cross-examination in that case. Remember Top Gun, Iceman and Maverick? And it, 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 they, they're watching Iceman, and then you hear Kelly McGillis, she's talking about uh, describing how Iceman was doing his, his evasive maneuvering. And she says, here's a textbook case. And they fade out because 
Maverick was pissed because he had done some hot shot maneuver. I was doing, there was no hot shot maneuver when I was doing. I was textbook impeachment. And of course, to this day, the judge has never produced a case because there isn't one that says I was doing it wrong because I wasn't. How did I handle that? I handled that in the moment. I dealt with the judge in, in, where he wanted to talk to me. He wanted to have this discussion in, 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 at the bench. I pointed out the rule very politely. And when he saw the rule, he wanted to tell me there was a case. He let me return to, I said, may I continue? And he said, yes, but I'm going to find that case. And when I do, I'm going to point it out to you. And I said, of course. And I went back and finished my cross-examination. That's how I handled that situation, with respect and humility. People don't think that I have that level of humility, but I do. I know the judge is the powerful person in the courtroom. I get it. I understand. I have another where I'm in the middle of, and I know people are, they think, what do you do about the judge that cuts off your cross-examination? You can't do much other than just keep going respectfully. Keep trying to just, if roadblocks come up, respectfully keep trying to get through your cross-examination. And when the judge tries to throw out there, well, Strzok and I think the jurors have, we've, all, we've gotten the point. With all due respect, judge, uh, I hope so, but what what point is is the court explaining that we all have? I want to make sure it's the same point. Because remember, the judge has heard a million cross examinations, but at this point, in this particular case, he was one of the most seasoned judges I've been in front of. Been practicing for for I think longer than I was alive. Because he was a visiting judge, and I I'm telling you. Uh, I have a great amount of respect for this judge. Great amount of respect. Uh, he's a he's a, um, a civil rights hero. Growing up, when I was growing up, went in front of him, tried a case in front of him, and I'm making I'm chopping away at, at a witness, and you get that comment. Well, I mean, you made your point, Mister Rackheim. Now, what point, here's the thing, what point is the judge talking about? There are 14 people on the jury. You're telling me that he, who's got a a million hours in the courtroom, and you've got 14 jurors who've never been in a trial before, that all 15 of them, they all have thought the same thing at the exact same point in time? I wish that the judge could hold up a sign. We get the point, right, jurors? The witness is a lying piece of shit, right? We got it. But you can't assume that. And then we got the point. What point? So how do you handle that? Depends on the judge and the circumstance. I have said, Your Honor, I I appreciate that. I hope that the point that I've been trying to make is is, is getting through. But with all due respect, I can't assume that all of the jurors have gotten, the point has been made with all of them the way it, was made with you. May I continue? Or, Your Honor, I, I, I hope that, that the point is made. But I would like to make sure that the point that you're referring to is noticed by the jurors as well. Is, or, if you even feel that you have some jurors on your side at that point, your Honor, I believe, I, I, I certainly hope that the point is made. But just for the record, Your Honor, what, what point are we? did you pick up on? Now, the challenge, of course, in asking a, the judge a question is it could really come back to, he could throw that ball right back at you with a lot more speed than you can throw it at him. But what am I, if nothing else, my, my, my standby reaction is, Your Honor, what point is... I hope that, I hope that that's the case, Your Honor. I hope that the all the jurors have picked up on the point that I'm trying to make, as you have. But I can't be sure. May I please continue? And of course, if you're looking at the jurors, maybe they are nodding and picking up on it. 
Maybe they're picking up on it. Maybe the judge responds. Remember, you're throwing a softball fungo pitch to the judge at that point to explain what the point is. You hope that he does. We get it, Mr. Ockine. We get the point. With all due respect, Your Honor, I, I'm glad that, that, that you have. I'm glad that it's becoming clear. The, the point that I'm trying to make is becoming so clear and so obvious. I hope that that is the case. But without knowing that the jurors have all got that point, I'd like to be able to continue. Respectfully, Your Honor. If at that point the judge wants to say, we got it, the witness is lying, or the witness lied, or the witness cut a deal in exchange for immunity, we got it, or the, the witness told two different stories or lied to the police and has admitted to lying, then the judge has made the point for the jury. <laughs> the point is, if there was anybody in the jury at that point that didn't know what the point was or didn't get it, they got it now because the judge has said it. But to just say, well, the point is made, move on. With all due respect, I, I, I don't know that. I hope, I hope that that's the case. I hope that they see this the same as you do, Your Honor. But I can't, you understand that I represent Mr. Smith over here, and I, I just, I can't count on that. May I please continue? I had a judge in that same trial that as I am obliterating an informant, a witness who was testifying uh, in exchange for immunity, like the truly guilty person in the case was testifying. Witness had, I I had put together a cross-examination where the witness ended up having to, he he tried to, to commit some insurance fraud and he had engaged in some, in a in an act of destruction of property, and then he was going to report it to the insurers. And I said it was your plan to lie to the insurance company, right? He says yes. You were going to tell the insurance company that the vehicle, the property in question was damaged, right? And you were going to tell them a reason, yes. And you were going to tell them that it was an accident, yes? It means you weren't going to tell them the truth was it wasn't an accident, right? Right. The truth is that you did that damage on purpose, right? Right. And you, you had a reason for telling the insurance company a lie, Right? And the witness started to balk, and I said, right, and he started to balk. He said, because you couldn't tell the insurance company the truth because they wouldn't, they would have denied your claim. You couldn't tell them that you did that on purpose. And then he wanted to back out, and he wanted to argue, and because I had essentially trapped him into conceding that he had committed insurance fraud. Intentionally, that he had a plan to do it. That he had a, he had a premeditated, deliberate plan to commit insurance fraud. He had thought it through and he knew what he had to say and he planned to go down to the, to the insurance company and file a claim and he wrote it out by hand and he wrote out what the explanation was and he got on the phone with the insurance adjuster and he had a plan to tell them what the reason was and that was all a lie. It was all a lie to get, to, to get money. Because if he told them the truth, they would deny the claim. He wouldn't get paid. And he started to hem and haw. And the judge actually jumped in. It was one of the funnier moments of the trial. The judge actually jumps in and goes, come on. And he says the witness's name. You know that you can't get money from an insurance company for if you do the damage yourself? Come on. Come on, sir. You know you can't get insurance money by intentionally destroying a damaging property. So just making my point for me. He was essentially saying that the witness was 
being evasive, that the witness was lying, that the witness was evading the question, that the witness wasn't answering truthfully. The witness was trying to dodge out of that, and the judge uh, uh, literally sort of padlocked the door and said, you're not getting away from this witness. You're not getting out of this one. I thought, this is great. The judge is telling the jury, telegraphing to the jury that the witness just attempted to lie or evade or be evasive in front of the jury. But as the trial wore on, as the cross examined wore on a bit, the judge sort of shifted gears and came to the witness's defense a couple of times. And at one point I actually had said that the witness was lying and the judge sort of almost came to his defense. Well, Mr. Rockine, we, we, we know what kind of person he is, but he's told you, he said that he did it. He's told you that he's now just here to tell the truth. So now I have the judge going the other way, sort of telegraphing to the jurors that the witness has come clean and now he's being truthful. And how you have to deal with that, people want to know, is how do you deal with that? You have to roll with it. And my response was very polite to the judge at that point. I didn't argue with him. I didn't accuse him of playing favorites, even though I knew that what he had said had potentially hurt my client's case. But he had telegraphed to the jurors that what the prosecution wants the jurors to know is that even that this guy who was a con artist and a fraud, that he's now admitted all he had done wrong and he was now being truthful, or at least that's what he said. And so I responded and said, well, Your Honor, I guess that remains to be seen. And with all due respect, Your Honor, I think the jury will have to make that call. Don't you agree? May I continue, please? Something along those lines. I had another... So I wasn't going to get into some argue, argue, some shouting match with the judge. Judge, you're being unfair, and what you just said was wrong, and that was, you know. I mean, I, I, I raised my very polite objection to the way the judge handled that issue, but I said what I had to say, but I did it politely, respectfully, and tried to redirect the energy from that. I wanted, I was hoping that with my comment that the judge would acknowledge that he wasn't saying that the witness was truthful. That instead what the witness, what he was trying to say was, he was just trying to summarize. Judge, I appreciate that that's what the witness's claim is today. I beg to differ, and that'll be up to the jury. May I continue, please? Something along those lines. I had another judge that, during a brutal trial, every morning the judge would invite us into chambers, want to hash out all of the issues about what issues for the day may come up, have these conferences, but, but by the time we raise our issues in chambers and we come back on the record, then the judge, when, when the issues came up, they just got a roadmap and got it all laid out and the rulings were immaculate because the judge had a, a roadmap, if you will, had advanced warning. Well, we'd stop that because I'm not coming into chambers. I'll just do it all on the record. Well, then I got to the point where I actually was cross-examining a witness and had a bit of a couple chapters of cross-examination of a witness where I believe that the witness would have to admit that she had lied to the police and that she could be, that there was, her lying to the police under those circumstances was a crime. And as I get there, the witness actually pleads the fifth in front of the jury. Just said, I plead the fifth. I didn't ask her if she pleaded the fifth. The witness just blurted out, I plead the fifth. 
I'm thinking job done. Direct testimony should be struck. Her testimony should be stricken. I said the judge got mad at me because, I mean, frankly, it was brilliant cross-examination. The judge got mad at me. Not that I basically sandbagged that I hadn't alerted the judge to this issue ahead of time and that I had essentially cornered the witness into pleading the fifth. None of which was true. It was just sandbagging. It's cross-examination. I'm not... I've, I already had days of laying out what the issues were and then them, the judge having all the issues perfectly, all these things perfectly buttoned up before we started with the, before they, when they came up. <laughs> of course, I was losing all those rulings. But I'm not going to tell anybody how I'm going to cross-examine a witness. I'm not going to show you the roadmap to me cross-examining so that you can be ready with a, a safety valve or an escape hatch for a witness. <coughs> no way. Might as well just hand my, the, the witness the night before my cross-examination notes so that the witness can you know, prepare for him. Now this case, I was, again, I'm telling you, all I was focused on was the client. I was patient. Every time the judge would interrupt or interfere or the judge would sigh or make faces. The judge hated this case. She hated it. But she would sigh. <sighs> she would roll her eyes. I got news for you. There's going to be almost nothing more distracting than a, a judge rolling their eyes. It sends a signal to everybody in the courtroom. And at one point, the judge actually after she did, did that. And my client and his mother said something to me, like they're just rolling her eyes. And I, I knew it wasn't warranted, but nothing I can do about it. Except I wanted to bring it to, and I thought this had been the third day or second or third day of trial, maybe the fourth day, whatever it was. Whatever it was and I wanted to bring it to the judge's attention. Respectfully. And I said, judge, the, and I said just what I'm telling you. Judge, the jury looks up to you. They watch you. They see how you're reacting to things. And I have, and I have to be honest that your, some of your reactions re- suggest that you're displeased with me, you're displeased with the questioning, or displeased with the defense. And that has an impact on the jurors. It has an impact on them. It has a, it has a way of de- uh, creating the appearance that you are demeaning the defense, which ends up hurting my client. Remember, all I'm concerned about, not my ego, I'm not worried about me, I'm worried about my client. And then the judge said, well, because well, I'm Mr. Ackerman, I know you're getting directions from your client or his mother. Well, first of all, I am getting directions from my client. It's my client's case in his life. So, yes, I'm getting directions from my client and from my, my client about his case. All his mother was doing was just looking and making observations and then sharing them with me so that I could react to them. And with that comment, I did push back, politely and respectfully, but, but I did push back. And I did make the point that, you know what, Judge, I'm, whatever you think of me, it doesn't matter what you think of me. Whatever you think of me, all that matters to me is the impact of your impression of me on what, how the jury sees my client. And I had, and I wanted the judge to know that I had taken note of it and then I put it on the record. I didn't do it in front of the jury. It wasn't mean, didn't raise my voice, wasn't accusatory. I said, but the things you're doing, Your Honor, they are denigrating me in front of the jury. They are demeaning me whether you think I'm worthy of that or not. And from that moment on, even though the judge denied my, my motion, denied that that was happening, she pretty much bit her lip and then stayed out of the case. I know there are lawyers who say, oh, I would have yelled at the judge and screamed and I would have you know, pounded the table. I've done that. But again, all that matters is, is that going to help the client? 
in a long trial, and I've had long trials, there have been moments where I believe that by the end of the trial, the jury viewed me as the more credible, reliable person in the courtroom. The jury was responding to me, and so the judge couldn't really, in that long trial, hurt me. But it was in that trial I had to make my record. I knew that the record was going to be important. I wanted the the judge to know that I was paying attention. And for a very long time, I was just eating it and taking it and trying to just get through it and get through it and let the facts speak for themselves and let the work speak for itself and let the, the, but it, one point I had to speak up. I needed to be able to point out that what was happening was unfair and demeaning me in front of the jury. So there's no perfect solution for how to deal with a difficult judge. There are jurors that don't like the tension that great cross-examination makes. They try to alleviate it by telling jokes. They don't like the fact that a witness is being cornered or is being forced to, is being verbally bludgeoned with great cross-examination. And they try to rescue the witness. And all you can do in those moments is try to keep pushing away. And if there it comes a point in time where you can keep pushing and pushing, keep doing your work, keep be respectful, don't scream or yell. Don't give the judge a platform to, 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 to you know, accuse you or to, to say you're doing, but keep pushing. And if you need to at a certain point, if, if you feel as though you have to stick up for yourself, you do it in the most respectful way because all that matters is the client. That's what matters. It's those jurors in the box and that person sitting next to you. That is what matters. So what I have tried to do is, in my experience, and I have pushed back against some judges, but I know that I'm not going to be able to hand the jurors a rules of evidence book and hand the jurors the cases so that they can do the research for a few minutes to know that I know more about how to properly cross-examine and I know more about this subject than the judge does. I've got to constantly figure out a way to get around, to get through, to get over, under. Doesn't mean to do anything wrong, but I have to keep trying to move forward, keep trying to do the case, keep being respectful. Hopefully the jurors will pick up on it. If it becomes a problem, you have to tell the judge that it's become a problem. You have to do it in a way that allows you, because you're going to have judges say, that's not the right way to cross-examine, Mr. Rockheim. Mr. Jones, that's the wrong way to cross-examine. And that can be embarrassing because you're doing it right and what you're doing is important and you know the judge is wrong. But all you can do is keep trying to say, judge, with all due respect, this is how, I'm, this is how I do it. This is... And if the judge says, you, I am requiring you to do it some other way, you can try to make your record, but... Don't make your record in a way that's going to get the jurors to have to choose between you and the judge. Because in a short trial, you'll lose that one. I wish that it were as simple as, you know, every judge had the criminal law and trial experience of like a Clarence Darrow, but they don't our job to figure out the personality on the bench. It's our job to figure out how can I get through this trial doing what I have to do in order to get the best result for my client. Look, if there are some cases where you feel like you have to push back, okay. But there could be a potential price to be paid for that. And I would suggest that in almost every circumstance, a lot of humility 
and just keep trying to do your work as you know how to do it will win the day. And if it does reach a point where you have to call the, the judge out, then do it in the most respectful way without creating a making the jurors, if they see the challenge, pick between you and the judge. As I said, I've had cases where after I raised my concern, the judge sort of backed off. Sometimes humility um, and some self-denigration, poking fun at yourself, can go a long way. But keep in mind the golden rule. What is most important is what gets the job done for your client. This is Neil Rockine, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Killer Cross-Examination. See you next time. Killer, Killer Cross-Examination A podcast by your host, the nationally renowned criminal defense attorney, Neil Rockine. Thank you.